Welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This show is about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your guest, Jason Fry. I'm an engineer here at IT Pro TV. With me today is your host, Cameron Guerra. He is one of our software engineers at IT Pro TV. Thanks for joining me today, Cameron. How's it going, Jason? I'm glad to be here. It's going really well, thank you. Oh yeah, well, uh, what are we doing here? I mean, I come just to hang out with you and be like, hey, let's do a podcast. So uh, what are yeah. we doing a podcast about? That's how that works. We're doing a podcast about Haskell, Cameron. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> we, we, there's a lot to talk about in Haskell. I don't think we have all that time. Not really. Uh, we're trying to keep this to 15 minutes. Haskell's pretty simple. Are, are very busy, busy, busy people. You Not know, much to do here. No? Oh, okay. Well, hopefully everyone will learn Haskell. Well, uh, so we were looking through Haskell Weekly, um, as we do most weeks, and found an article that you and I can talk about and maybe springboard off of mm -hmm. called Four Tweaks to Improve Haskell. Mm -hmm. yeah. so let's talk through that. Yeah, it, it seems pretty interesting. Uh, reading through it, uh, it looks like Digital Assets is the one who wrote this. Uh, they seem to be pretty big in that the Haskell community um, and also kind of in the open source world, which is kind of cool. And they kind of seem to have some sort of idea that there's, there's tweaks in Haskell, which every programming language has enhancements. And I think today we should kind of talk about what's good about these tweaks, maybe some of our frustrations with these tweaks. But the first one they mention is pretty interesting, something I'm on board with because I'm a lover of Elm. Uh, they call it the new colon convention, which is quite funny because as you know, I type declarations in for functions in Haskell are double colon. Um, and they make the joke that Haskell would be a much faster lightweight language if we just took out that double colon made it a single colon. Yeah. Like like our language of Elm, you know? Yeah. You you mentioned Elm and we love Elm, but what what is annoying about Elm is that it does the opposite of Haskell here. So this convention is just saying, no, do what Elm does. So you when when you have the type signature, you use a single colon instead of a double colon. And then I guess cons would be two colons. Mm -hmm. And you use cons probably far less than you use um, the type signature, the, the, the declaration there. So yeah, that would, they say hackage would be one megabyte smaller. Which is pretty substantial considering. That feels like a lot. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty cool. We are Elm users here at IT Pro, so we are very familiar with the syntax. So it would make it pretty easy for us to switch over in Haskell because I can't tell you how many times I end up type in double colon when I'm in ha Elm and then single colon when I'm Haskell. You know, we do permissive pairing here and, and generally my pair is like, uh, are you trying to do Haskell or Elm? Like, what, what are you doing here? Yeah. Uh, so it would, it would make my life a little simpler if we just had uh, one convention that went across Elm and Haskell. Yes, but one thing I will say against this is that the idea with cons is that, I'm going to mess something up here, but you are, uh, you're, you're visualizing the spine of the list with these single colons, which makes a lot of sense theoretically. But I think uh, what Evan does with Elm, I've heard people say that he... He does okay breaking with convention if it makes it more sensible inside the language. And I think that's why he's done it that way with two colons being cons instead of the one colon. So while a double colon cons and a single colon type declaration would mean less typing, less colons, I, I can see like why Haskell did it that way. Mm -hmm. I doubt it will ever change in Haskell. But overall, I'm on board too with this mm -hmm. change. Yeah, and one other thing before we move on to the next one is they also, they tend to use the you know, list constructor uh, as the type instead of putting brackets around their, their types uh, for a list, which is kind of a very Elm-based thing as well. So I literally, when I saw this article, I was like, did they write Elm or did they write Haskell? Because uh, <laughs> it literally looks like something I would find in our Elm right right now if we went into there. Yeah, that's valid Elm. Yeah, for sure. Funny enough. <laughs> but... No, and I think that's cool, and I'm on board with that one as well. I think they're onto something, but like you said, I think Haskell's not going to change it, and that's no. okay. Um, I know there's been conversations preparing for this, kind of looking through what was what. Uh, there was definitely some issues about it, and there was good good conversation about it, but the bottom line was nobody else wants it, uh, especially <laughs> if they're not an Elm user. They, they're used to Haskell this way, so they're not going to change, which is totally, totally valid reason. But the next one they kind of talk about is record with syntax, which this kind of confused me a lot. And that's probably contradicting myself is like, I'm used to Haskell. And so like, it looks weird because it looks more like something in Python or 
uh, you know, mm-hmm. something you'd use in one of those scripting languages. It just it seems a little little wonky. What do you think, Jason? Well, I, I agree with you, however, with a big caveat that the authors of this uh, post are smarter than me. Uh, Shane Fletcher and Neil Mitchell. Neil Mitchell uh, is probably well known for being the author of Hoogle and HLint and GHCID, um, which we use all three of those here. Mm -hmm. So he's smarter than me. So either they didn't make a good enough case for this, or they made a great case and I'm a bit slow, or it's just not good. What I don't like about the width syntax is that it's five characters versus two. And width only has four characters in it, but there's an extra space you have to put in there. So it's longer. And to me, it doesn't enclose the record. Mm -hmm. I like the curly brackets enclosing the record. Um, This is, but this is one of those things that, you know, people can have holy wars over what is essentially completely unimportant. Mm -hmm. But those are my two opinions. It's longer to type and it doesn't visually enclose the record, which I've come to appreciate. Right. And like they have some examples of little functions that like setter functions that doesn't really seem to help. Like I I can see their reasoning for it because like they have a simple function that says set this value to two. And so the function calls blah with foo equals two and it says, okay, set this record, it's field foo to two. Uh, but it just does not, it just doesn't feel, doesn't feel right. Like I feel like I would rather say at this point I would, be able to just put record like put all that r that's there and then use rec- record syntax and, and put in the attributes of, you know we're trying to update yeah and and that's the thing they say is that um its impact on readability is profound and i, I don't know if it's profound but that that little function that you that you say this function is called set foo to so with the record syntax that means r you know, bracket, foo equals two, bracket, right? That mm-hmm. these, you know, it's awkward to say those words. It's awkward to describe that. But with the with syntax, you would say set foo two r equals r with foo equals two. That's easy to say in English. Mm-hmm. I'm just reading it off the page. It does make sense with that. You're saying, okay, this new r is going to be the old r with foo equals two now. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I get how that readability is a little better, but I'm not a big fan of this, especially when you're using it when creating the data type. Mm-hmm. I don't like the width there, and I don't know how it would look if you're updating multiple things at once. So is that R with foo equals two, comma, bar equals three, mm-hmm. comma, X. I, I'm not sure what that would look like, but I, I'm just not a fan. Yeah, and they brought semicolons back. I, I try to escape JavaScript. Um their like their inline data declaration for t is like separated by colons and like i'm like meh, semicolons i'm like i don't really want to deal with that but i get the readability wise like yeah like it's very like okay this with this equals this which is nice but it, it also seems like they probably their record extensions or not the record extensions their overall haskell extensions kind of allowed this to be more useful mm-hmm. than we're used to we have minimal language extensions here at it pro Overloaded strings, come of the basics, nothing crazy. And so they're talking about, you know, they use record puns and record wildcards. And that may be helpful for these records if they use with syntax. Um, yeah. I just don't know enough about that to say one way versus the other. Yeah. And, and I'm going to go ahead and assume that, that that is where the uh, power of this thing lies because you're right. We don't use those extensions. I'm, I'm going to have to assume that, again, they're smarter than us. So mm-hmm. that's why they like that. Yeah, no, I, I I would say that too. Well, yeah, there's there's another pretty cool one that I'm kind of I'm on board with. I was very confused the first time I saw it, but they call it inline functions, inline function return type annotation. So, uh, pretty much what this is doing is giving a function a type declaration at the same time you declare the function. So, it reduces line costs, which is nice, but it allows you to say, okay, we have a function. It's going to take a variable with colon the type. Um, and then colon the type that the function returns, uh, which I, he seems kind of nice. Like it doesn't seem terrible, especially for like quick functions that you're using to, you know, just one time use makes it pretty easy to say, like, okay, let's, let's put this, we know what this type needs to be. And it tells Haskell's compiler, like, Hey, this is what type this is without needing necessarily its own line to say, oh, this is what this type is. Mm-hmm. And I feel like 
I mean, I'm certain there are languages that actually have this syntax very similar to this, and I'm trying to remember which one or ones. I, I'm wanting to say pure script, TypeScript, something like that, uses this syntax. And at first, yeah, I, I, can, I can get on board with this, and it's not bad. But at first, when I thought about this, um, yeah, I was confused. And then when I, 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 I grokked what was going on there. I, I thought, well, what if you have several you know, parameters to this function, three or mm -hmm. four parameters, and the parameter name, because you want to be very clear with what this parameter is, it's something that's more than just one character. So right. what I'm getting at is you end up with this, this declaration that's really long and is going to break over multiple lines anyway. Right. So uh, that's going to not, it's not going to help if your intent is to take the function definition and signature and roll them into one line. But I think there's more to it than that, but I just want to point that out. No, yeah, I would agree with that. It could definitely make, it could get a little hair if you have more than one argument, one or two arguments to the function. So I'm definitely on board with that. Looked like this kind of interesting fact that they had pointed out was GHC had always parsed the signatures, but would just throw an error in the later phase, uh, which is kind of interesting. Like, they're like, it's a good sign that they're a logical construct in Haskell, you know, like allowing that to be something that maybe not super difficult for Haskell to implement one day. But yeah, I'm still, I'm still definitely on the fence about this one, but I definitely feel better about it today than I did about yesterday, you know? Because I was like, hey, like, what's this thing? And me, you, and Dustin were like, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took us a moment to grok it, um, for sure. But I, and I think that may be telling is that yesterday we weren't quite as happy with it, but today we're a little bit better with it. So, you know, like most people, we're, we don't like that change. We don't like change. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm over here Googling, trying to figure out which language it is that has a similar syntax. And I thought it was pure script, but it looks like that is not it. Mm. But yeah, I can't find it. But anyway, yeah, th this is interesting because... It lets you, it just puts together the type with the named parameter closer mm -hmm. so that, I mean, I don't think it's much of a problem when they're separate, but it just, I don't know, maybe a little nicer. No, I would agree. Uh, I mean, maybe it could be C++ that they're cribbing from over here. On, uh, yeah, because C++ has inline functions that tell you the, like, like inline and the, then the return type and then the function. But I don't know if that's really, I don't know. I was just trying to do some research too, just to kind of. See if they see if we could figure out what it was. Um, yeah, but I mean, but they have a reason for it. It's more like here's TypeScript. Mm. Yeah, so you have value colon string padding colon any, and so that's I think it's that that it looks a lot like. But you're right, C plus plus Java they do have a way of telling you what the type is in line. But I meant the particular syntax of you know uh, parameter colon type parameter right. colon type. Yeah, it does it does look a lot like TypeScript. That's that's true. Should have should have thought about that. We do have one repository here at IT Pro that, that is TypeScript for one of our internal applications. That you know, we I wish we understood the concept of functional programming when we when we wrote that because at this point it looks like a JavaScript. It's just <laughs> JavaScript. Everything is any. You know. Yeah, yeah. Every time I open it up um, in VS Code, VS Code will say, "Hey, I have something to help you with this TypeScript file," and I I'm confused because I'm like this is a JS file and I don't see any TypeScript syntax in here. Right. Yeah. So there's like one thing in there or something that tells it it's a TypeScript and otherwise just JavaScript. Yeah, pretty much. Which, you know, that is what it is. We, uh, yeah, we live and learn. But yeah, so I, obviously that's three of the four we've talked about here today. And the other, the final one is, you know, most of these are all stylistic. Obviously, there's no real functional changings here. Uh, but the last one is, is the module qualified syntax. So I like it. I do too, to an extent, um, and this is probably my just lack of knowledge, is that I, I just wish it could be like Elm, where you could just import blah, and then you could use it as blah dot whatever, you know, instead of it just, instead of you importing blah, and it just imports everything that blah exports, which I understand Elm's different than Haskell, but I do kind of like that rather than like always exposing everything that a function has. You know, Elm says you have to tell me what you want to expose if you're going to expose everything, uh, or you can access it through the qualified name, which is kind of I, I prefer that when I go back and read it. But this is an improvement. I do agree. It helps with like the tab issues. You know, where you know you've got one import statement and then you've got you know a non-imported statement, and 
they just look wonky, especially if you use like, um, not Brittany, uh, Hindent. Mm-hmm. Hindent looks really wonky, which it's like, it, it looks clean, but at the same time, you're like, this could just be better. Um, so their proposed solution was, uh, just instead of import qualified M, you would use import M qualified, which reads better too. Cause like, okay, I'm, I'm importing M as qualified rather than like import qualified M. Like it doesn't necessarily read well. And it seems a lot like they're very much on board with just kind of making Haskell easier to read for the human, uh, which isn't bad. I think it's a good, I think it's a noble yeah. cause. But yeah, I, I would be on board with this one as well if they could just do like not export everything and just implicit, like implicitly have to expose whatever you want to use if you want to ex- expose everything in, in a module. Yeah. And I, I, I'm more okay with, with Haskell's way of doing things than, than you are. I know it's not a big deal for either one of us, but the reason I really like this is, I mean, most of these come down to the way we use the language versus somebody else. Mm-hmm. So the way we use Haskell is we will Im- we import everything qualified. So data.json, for instance, you, when working with JSON stuff, we import qualified data.json as ASON, and then we use it, you know, ASON dot to JSON or whatever. But there are some weird infix operators in there that always look really ugly whenever you qualify them. So you mm-hmm. have ASON dot, what is it, dot colon or colon equals or whatever. Right. That just looks colon. really weird. So we will explicitly import the infix operators that we're going to use. So we have import qualified data.json as ASON and then import data.json, you know, parens, and then we, and then we list all the infix operators. So no big deal. But in addition, we, we uh, sort our import lists alphabetically. When you have it that way, the import qualified is, comes differently in the order than import data.json infix operators. Right. So what I like about this is that you have import and then the library name and then other stuff. So mm-hmm. if you have import data.json qualified as ASON, that will come right next to import data.json infix operators. Right. So that's why I like it because right now I had to sort the import list, I had to sort them and then like, you know, automatically and then manually resort them to get those infix operator imports in the right spot. Right. And then there's some question of, and this is silly, but you know, software engineers were a silly bunch. Do you do the qualified data.json first or second? And where are the infix operators? So um, I just don't want to have to think about these things. No, <laughs> I fair. just want to, you know, select this list, hit colon sort in Vim, and boom, it's done. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I want. And this would make that possible. But yeah, it's, it's also more readable. It's mm-hmm. more, more, it's closer to English, at least, I should say. I, you know, there's a lot of people writing Haskell that don't speak English very much or, or at all. So I don't know what it's like for them in their language, but um, certainly better for English. I would agree. Yeah. There's definitely a few perks in this document especially in this bullet point of the, the imports one being readability the other being sorting which is a little more minor you know that's not necessarily all that that big um, but i do really appreciate these two authors writing this article i think it was it was good food for thought um, it really allowed us to kind of understand what maybe some of our opinions and solidify some of our opinions about haskell and why we like haskell mm-hmm. um, and, and challenge some of our opinions and be like okay why why do you like that I think that was really important as we, as an engineering team, are getting more and more familiar and comfortable with Haskell. Uh, this allowed us to really form an opinion and be have a little pride about how, like, what we like about Haskell. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. I like this article, and and again, the authors Shane Fletcher and Neil Mitchell are smarter than I or agreed or Cam. I can speak for Cam on this one. Ouch. <laughs> I, I, but I agree. I do agree. I do agree. So I, you know, I said before that their opinions are righter than mine. Uh, generally speaking. So, so any, any, anytime I differ with these folks, I want to give that caveat that they're certainly smarter than me. But, right. uh, and, but like I said, it comes down to, I think, largely how do you use the language and we just use it differently than they do because they have different uh, extensions on or just, or whatever. And uh, I think that's the main difference. Right. And, and I think they're trying to, like most Haskell shops around town, like if you're trying to find someone to come in and learn Haskell, you want to remove as many barriers as possible. And so I think they were trying to kind of bring Haskell more to a point of a, a TypeScript and cleaning up some of the the clutter that, that can kind of trip up people in Haskell. Obviously, it just takes a couple times to, to fully understand and grok what's going on. But 
you know, if you can remove those barriers before they happen, like that, that's good, you know? Yep. Um, so I definitely do applaud them for that. And I, I do appreciate them taking the time to kind of express their feelings on this subject, especially because they both have different backgrounds, you know, Shane, very much C++, OCaml kind of style. So I'm sure curious what maybe what OCaml influenced on this article mm. um, and on this it sounds like this kind of sounds like this is their style of Haskell for digital asset. Um, you know, they kind of have that internal format kind of that they write Haskell in. So I yeah. think this is probably more of an internal thing that they decided to share externally, which is it was greatly appreciated. I would say I learned something from this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point. You know, Shane's experiences in C++, which I know a little bit about and OCaml, which I know nothing about <laughs> and Neil Mitchell. Um, I'm sure he has a lot of experience in a lot of things, but certainly Haskell is the, is the main one from this description, it seems like. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe OCaml, there's some similarities here with OCaml stuff or something. Yeah, I know. Neil Mitchell, he seems like a really cool guy. He's got a PhD. Definitely smarter than I am. Yeah, we use HLint and GHCID all the time and yeah. Google. Yeah. So, so love it. obviously the guy knows what he's doing. Well, Jason, I just want to thank you for being on the show today with me. It's my pleasure. And thank you guys for listening to Haskell Weekly Podcast. This has been episode nine. Uh, if you like our show, find out more at our website, haskellweekly.news. Thanks again for listening. I've been your host, Cameron Kara. We'll see you again next week. Bye.